Is marriage really outdated? Today we're going to break down what our role is to make marriage beautiful and inspiring as a culture, but also for our children, because married life has been proven to make people happier. And people that stay married are happier. Yes, it's not perfect. And yes, there's need to be training and actually how oh, to make our married life more fulfilling with the right skill. But people are less happier today. And if married life makes people happier, then we need to talk about why are there less people actually opting for married life. So let's break this down. And the incentive that I have here for you that are listening is that how do we make married life attractive for our own children, for our own families? What is our role and responsibility as women so that we can rebuild culture? And that's our role. I think that is part of our contribution to society is to elevate culture. And how do we do that through marriage? So I'm going to share with you this uh, podcast. One of my favorite podcasts is Patrick Bet David, and he talks about a lot of hard issues and he hits it right on the head, and he, I think it's it's a great topic that he's kind of talking about is marriage outdated. So here is a bunch of men talking about marriage. So let's break it down. Marriage outdated. Marriage outdated. Adam, be ready. Two in five young adults now think that, that picture is is kind of selling the idea. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> two in five young adults think the tradition no longer matters. A survey reveals that two in five young adults consider marriage an outdated tradition with a with 85% believing that a fulfilling and committed relationship doesn't require marriage. The sentiment is more prominent among women, 52%. Wow, 41% men. The survey re reflects a broader trend as one in four 40 year olds in the US have never married. And 34% of people 15 and older have never been married. 15 and older, 15 and older, never been married. Okay. The rising cost of weddings is a major deterrent, and 73% of millennials and Gen Zers considering it too expensive. Young adults feel judged for not being married, especially by their mothers. 69% of women, 27% of men. Fear of divorce is also a significant factor, with 47% expressing concerns, and many couples lack plans for shared responsibilities like pets and children in case of a breakup. So Adam, why do you, what do you think about this article here? Well, like, is marriage worth it? Is it not worth it? What are your thoughts on this? I mean, let me just say this. I think that uh, at the end of the day, men and women are better together. I think uh, we're here with PHP. I think uh, you guys, how many, how many of you guys are married couples working together? There you go. There you like, go. Literally everyone. Exactly. And I'm not pandering to the audience. I genuinely believe that. Respect. But 90% of the hands we just went up. Yes. Yep. Well, I don't know what that was. Um, but you might have saw that I uh, was trending on. Uh... Okay, so let's break this down a little bit. So why is it that less two out of five young adults are opting out of marriage? Now, what's our role? What can we do to inspire people to say that if marriage actually, if, if, if two people are better together, then how can we invite people to actually commit to married life? And I think real, the reality is that we feel like, how do we even begin to change culture January where, you know, if that's what's happening, then how do I, what's my role as a woman to change it? And all I'll say here is that your role is how you're living your own married life for the sake of your own children, but also for the sake of the people that are watching your own married life. Because the reality that we are seeing is that less people want to get married because we have modeled for them the challenges of married life. We haven't made married life attractive. The idea that you get married is, you know, so we laugh about married life as sort of losing yourself, right? This is where you have less freedom. This is where you kind of lose yourself. When in reality, you know, we are imagine being in love five, 10, seven, eight years, being so fulfilled in your married life. How much more can you do with your life when you are happy with your intimate life? And the reality is that you can do so much more. You can conquer the world when you have that one person that you can grow with and grow old with, and you know it's a home for you. It's, it's a place of rest. But because of how it's being advertised, whether it's you know, maybe your your own parents or maybe the way Hollywood falsely advertises marriage or just 
the way we so callously, you know, take marriage for granted has probably contributed to why less people want to get married, right? So how can we control that? We, we can't. We can only control how we are living our, our married life. And so the question we have to ask ourselves here is that how are we training ourselves as women individually and also our spouse together so that we will have the skills and the mindset and the skill set that we need so that we can make our married life attractive. So then collectively, if we are taking responsibility as a couple and individually in developing horse, you know, ourselves, then that's how we raise and elevate culture because we can reset the expectations that couples actually train together, couples actually grow together. That married life is the most amazing thing. Married life is really hard when you're underskilled, when you don't know how to communicate effectively, when you don't know how to manage your own mind, or perhaps you have unprocessed wounds, or you don't know how to draw firm boundaries, or you don't know how to hold your spouse accountable. Married life is very hard. But if you have these skills, married life is beautiful. Married life is so fulfilling. And I think that's what we need to do as women is reflect on our responsibility and how we can make married life attractive, because there's a lot, I think, of teaching out there, especially in the faith-based communities where you say, well, married life is, you know, is, is, is divine and God wants us to be married. Yes, I actually agree with that. But if our life do not reflect a beautiful marriage, a beautiful relationship, then we can preach all we want. We are going to sound very hypocritical. And it's unless our married life is attractive, Essentially, we have no right to preach about married life because it's going to come back to haunt us. So what do we do? We reflect our own life. And does our life need, if we want our children to find partners that are going to respect them, that are going to actually help them fulfill who they were created to be, then the best way we do that is to model it for them right? Because we can't tell them, go out there, find somebody that's going to respect you, that's going to honor you. And we don't respect ourselves in a relationship as women, as mothers, as wives. We tolerate a lesser version of ourselves, but we also tolerate a lesser version of a man. So we, I think, need to strategize as mothers on how we can make our lives, including our married life, so attractive to our children. And then that's how we then individually raise the bar for our culture and elevate our culture. So I'm going to talk about, cause he talks about the why here. And I think it's it too. Uh, social it's media, in. me and my ex-girlfriend, Chelsea Handler had yep. a bad breakup. Yeah. Heartbreaking. You know? I remember you were emotional about you it. Know, I'm had... into that used up uh, 50 year old lady vibe. <laughs> and um... okay. <laughs> he completely does like a little jab in there. You can tell he's angry, right? 50 year old lady who's angry and you can tell there's some unprocessed wounds there that if he doesn't process that, he could then assume that every other lady out there who's unmarried is angry. So it's very important to sort of point these out because these are real wounds that men are having. And what are we doing to now miss, you know, to represent, you know, a better version of a woman that's not angry, right? So that we don't have this stereotype that women are just you know, they use men and they're angry and whatever the stereotype that our culture has decided what women are, what we need right now is a new woman, a new woman that we can say, whoa, that's the kind of woman I want to spend the rest of my life with. How can I become that woman? Who is that woman? There's a new woman rising from these ashes. When we talk about the feminist movement with a hundred years ago, we had no freedom. We had no choice. We were, you know, stuck with kind of as a second class citizen to now we can do whatever we want, Right. We have freedom, but we also are not free. Free meaning that we are happy with our lives, we are fulfilled with our lives, that we can choose our highest and best self. And so what we have is data that tells us that now women have so much freedom, but they are not any happier than they were when they had no freedom. So why? And that's the question. Um, I think there's two things going on here. I think, number one, women um, have been fed a um, bowl of lies from modern-day feminism. Uh, telling them that they don't need a man, go out, work, like make your money. Why need a man in your life? Just do it by yourself. And th I think that. Okay. <laughs> so let's write that down. Women today have been fed a bowl of lies. We don't need men. Ask yourself, do you feel like, number one, you, you're you so needy that you can't live without a man? Or do you feel like, number two, the opposite extreme where I don't need a man, I can do it on my own? Both extremes, uh, both are extremes because we need men in our life, but we are to be interdependent, not codependent. 
right? And so maybe if you can kind of sort of collectively is 100 years ago, I need men in my life, right? We had no freedom and that men needed to be part of our life in order for us to operate in society to now I don't need a man at all. This new woman is capable of saying to herself, I can make my choice. I am free and I don't need a man in some things in my life, but I do need a man in my life, right? Maybe I don't need a man to build this for me because I know how to do it, but no, I need a man in my life. That men are are part of what makes this civilization flourish. That the idea that we can have men, that, that we can just eradicate men, which is what essentially, indirectly, what we have been doing as society is eradicate men. And not, not in a way where we're saying, you know, men no longer exist, right? That, they, that we can't define it, but rather we have emasculated them. We have so disrespected who they are as a man that that so many men right now are incapable of actually rising up to a level of manhood and a level of standard because we have robbed them of the very gift that they are in this world. So let's continue. That's just an absolute shame because I think that women, the number one role of a woman, whether it's- Here we go. Here it is. I think, and I ask married women all the time. Get the shoes ready, lady. Here we go. ladies. I don't care how much money you make, what you do for business, the best thing you've ever done is have children and raise great children, okay? I'm looking at many women right here. As amazing as Sheena is, and as amazing as Marlene is, whoever's out there, your kids are the best, yeah. are they not? Okay, you would trade everything you're doing She noticed how quiet here. they were? Well, they, yes. Just recently, <laughs> you know, it's, it's been summer, kids yeah. been home, so I guess my- Okay. Why are we trying to eradicate motherhood? Okay. Now, I think that we are, you know, we have to break this down because if you think about what he's saying is that I think the greatest thing that we offer in this world is that we can actually bear children. Men can never bear children. I know they're trying to. I know they're trying to redefine it. Now we have the men that can chest feed, which is, I think, is an abused children. And we have to call it for what it is. Essentially, the very thing that makes us so beautiful to men, the very thing that actually makes us beautiful to ourselves, the very thing that can allows the civilization to continue, we are saying, you know what? It can be for men too, right? That we are no longer revering the sacredness of motherhood. And I say that the revering the sacredness of motherhood because the way we look at motherhood today is sort of the death of our own freedom. We see motherhood as sort of hard, awful, horrible. We lose ourselves. So the sacredness of the very thing that I think actually men see us as something beautiful is something that we have lost sight of. How to be a mother. Now, it doesn't mean, you know, not all of us can bear children, but the nurture that is required for a woman, the, the, the skill, the embodiment of what it means to nurture, whether you have children or don't, is what actually makes that so beautiful. And that is best, I think, you know, I, I think um, manifested in being a mother, right? So to me, when you look at and study the history of feminism, and I want to point out that we have so much to be grateful for, for our freedom and, fem, you know, the, the feminists fought for and the rebellion that they had to go through in order to achieve our ability to vote, our ability to have equal, you know, uh, opportunities in the marketplace for us to be able to work at home and also have a career outside of our homes. We have to be grateful for the freedom that we are now living, at least in the Western world, that we really didn't have a hundred years ago. And they died for that freedom. When I say died, I mean, they were crucified for it. Maybe not physically, but they laid their life for it. Now, also, like any movement, it's not perfect. The feminist movement and sort of how it's evolved is that they believed that motherhood was what hindered them from actually being part of the marketplace, right? That motherhood was the barrier that allowed them to have equal rights. So it was uh, kind of a, an abandonment of the very gift of our nature as women is our ability to actually bear a child, nurture it, 
And so what we have is how that belief is trickling down in our culture where there's a lack of reverence for motherhood, but also that in order for us to have equal rights, then we have to suppress the very thing that actually makes us beautiful as women. Now, I want to point out that I think that there is a new woman rising, and I talk about this new woman where she is a mother, and she also is somebody who's not afraid of her own strength, that she can be in the world, that she understands with great reverence who she is as a woman and as a mother, but at the same time, she's no pushover. She she also understands that she needs a man in her life, that I think this new woman that's embodying, right, that, that it's sort of coming from these ashes is somebody that has a deep respect for who she is as a woman, but she's not trying to be a man. And I'll also say that I think what makes us so attractive to men is that we can nurture our ability to nurture as women, which I would say is drawn out of us when we be, when we become mothers. And I think we should not abandon that. I, th- I think I think we should be strong enough to own our choices, to take responsibility and how to take care of ourselves, but never lose sight of the tenderness that is required for us to take care of men, that nurturing ability that we can be so strong and tender at the same time, that we can be so responsible and, and not feel like we're, you know, this needy woman, but at the same time, we're able to also feel like the men around us need us. And there's that level of vulnerability. I think it's unattractive for women to feel to to embody this belief where we don't need we don't need men. And it's so attractive for a man to be around women who feel like they're not needy, but they revere their presence. There's a level of respect that there's a level of, wow, I need you in my life. And that we can that we can hold space for what is ma- for what makes us so unique and so beautiful as a human person individually but also collectively as both a man and a woman and i think men are looking for that kind of woman i think men are looking t- i mean just the hard truth is it, it, that woman that's not that is that's resisting this so this feminist agenda to be a man i think deep down inside men want women that are women Real men, I would say. Men that also have not been emasculated. I think men want strong women. So strong that they're capable of being vulnerable. And so what I want to point back into, again, is that making marriage attractive requires us to pay attention to the feminist movement's, uh, I would say, propaganda that has seeped into who we are, where we want to be in a beautiful relationship where we are admired by the guy that we love, but simultaneously we sort of reject who they are by rejecting who we are. And who we are is that we are women endowed with different gifts. And the way we make marriage so attractive to our children is that we know our throne, we know our space, we know who we are, that we are here to nurture, that we that we can nurture. It doesn't mean men can't nurture. It doesn't mean, but we own that, that we are not afraid of being a nurturing, caring human being, that we can be tender and that we also can be nurtured, that we can receive, right? That I, I, there was a quote, I think it was from Mother Teresa, and and I never forgot, it was my freshman year in college, and it said, the power of a woman lies in her capacity to receive um, and nurture love. And I just thought, wow, the power of a woman is her capacity to receive and nurture love. We receive the love of a man, and we nurture it. And I think that we should almost reassess how we have treated men in the last hundred years and pay attention to what's happening in our culture where people no longer want to be married because of the way we're treating each other and learn from it and say, how can can we retrain women so that they know how to value who they are and not become a victim to wanting to be a man? That they can own the sacredness of being a woman and the respect that they have for themselves that They're not afraid 
of being tender. They're not afraid of being a nurturer. They're not afraid of being sort of a walking contradiction of a strong woman and yet so tender at the same time. Because nobody wants an angry feminist. <laughs> nobody. I mean, it's it's not attractive to men. And what we have is women who have been sold a lie, a bowl of lie, like you said, that have a kind of sold themselves this idea that it's okay for them to bash men and, it, and, and that they don't need men, and, but simultaneously they wish they had a man who respected them. It's sort of this sort of conflicting belief. And what we want to do is raise the bar for men. What we want to do is be that woman who inspires our man, be that woman who loves the woman that we are becoming, right? Because if we don't love who we are becoming, then how do we expect men and our partners to love the woman that we are? And that requires us to kind of see where these radical uh, idea of eliminating men in our lives as though we don't need them have seeped into every arena of her life. You know, maybe it's in our kitchen and say, no, you, I don't need your help. Or maybe I'm not going to let you, you know, build this because I can build it myself, right? And, and it doesn't mean that we can't build it for ourselves. It just means that we're better together. And I think that's the idea is that how can we advertise what it means to be better together? How can we make a, tr you know, married life so attractive? How can we as women exercise our ability to communicate um, a deep reverence for men that they can see in our eyes and the way we show up a deep respect for manhood, a deep respect for who they are. And I think that that kind of woman is the kind of woman that I believe is, is almost becoming rare in our culture today. But also I think that it's what's needed in our culture moving forward. If we are going to work together, then men need to be men and women need to stop being coming like men. And that's how we have attractive marriages that work together and that complement each other and that are living lives that respect each other's unique contribution to this world. Um, so I guess the question that you, you and I and all of us need to reflect is that how are we elevating marriage? And if you are a man or woman of faith out there, a woman of faith, how are you living your married life so that it is attractive to your children so that it is actually advertising uh, what it means to be married and advertising, I would say, a deep reverence for the sacredness of both what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. Because that's what our world needs right now is, you know, Buckminster Fuller said, you can't fight the old model. You have to build a new one. And I think the new model that we are building is one that honors with great reverence the strength of each, you know, gender, both male and female, but at the same time is free to rely on the other or that where we are perhaps lacking. And I think that's the new model is that no, it's it's not that we're not equal. It's actually that we are equal and different and that we complement each other and that we need each other and that great marriages are possible when we are willing to work on ourselves, when we're willing to work on each other and we come together knowing who we are with a deep understanding of proper healthy self-love, not based on narcissistic you know, tendencies, but really to love ourselves that's based on knowing ourselves. And I think that's what makes that marriage so beautiful and so attractive. And I think we owe it to the next generation to advertise the beauty of married life. And it requires us to actually look from within and see how am I showing up by my own marriage so that is attractive to my children. If you like this, follow us on Instagram. And also subscribe to our channel as we give you more practical life training. I share with you uh, also the why, why it's important for us to rebuild culture and what our role is as women, but then also the practical life skills that you're going to see in our channel. So don't forget to click subscribe so you can get our updated latest training video. And also, if you want to learn and continue to grow, we have a free course that we offer. It's called How to Be a Woman. Free course, go to How to Win Free Course, and you can sign up uh, for our free course with a free coach 
just need to commit for one month. The whole course is a month and it gives you the foundation of what is necessary for us to learn how to be a woman. And all that is for you for free with a coach, with a training to sign up for um, your month when you want to take that course and invest in who you want to become as a woman. 